Okay, everybody, welcome to, we're going to have a new name for this, Outside the Cage with Javier Mendez podcast. We have our special guest, Scott Coker, very anticipated podcast. And we have, of course, Javier, which on every video that we have. These two guys go back a long time. They are the godfathers of MMA, in my opinion. And it started with Scott and Javier. Actually, Scott used to train Javier. I wanted to know what was that like? How did you guys get to know each other initially? Actually, Javier, that a question at, for me? Okay, go, Scott. I think Javier and his brother came to, I think, my martial arts program. Is that right, Han? You were yeah. training somewhere else, and then yeah. you came into our school, and then we started. he started training with our, our group, and, and basically, he was already talented, already had some you know, great technique, and more of a really traditional martial arts uh, student at that time. And what I remember was him telling me, hey, I, I, I really don't even want to do this. I really want to become a fighter. And uh, then we, did, we had a different conversation because I was already promoting at the time. And that, I think that's when the transition happened was he went from traditional martial arts to being a kickboxer. Yeah, it, and it was more me talking more than actually wanting to do it because I used to be a could have, would have, should have guy. And you, we, you and I were sitting at Denny's and we were talking and you said you needed <laughs> someone to, to work, go with Bill Superfoot Wallace. That's right. And like an idiot, I said, I'll do it. And I really didn't want to do it. And you said, you're on. And I was like, scared shitless. I was like, what the, did I get myself into? So I decided <laughs> to go ahead and do it. That's how it all started. But it started exactly like you're saying. I was a would have, should have kind of guy. I used to talk about, if I could do this. I really want to be this. I just want to be a fighter. You asked me if I wanted to be a black boss. I said, no, I just want to learn how to fight. Correct. Right. Yeah. Here's an opportunity. You want to be a fighter? I have somebody for, <laughs> with whom you can fight. His name is Bill Superfoot Wallace. Yeah. And uh, Bill was a pretty established kickboxer and pro professional karate fighter at the time and had a great history. One of the most famous icons of martial arts in you know, Wisconsin for the last 40, 50 years. And uh, he had fought on, I think it was on a CBS television or NBC. He had some big fights. He had fought for many years and he was a, a big fighter on the point karate circuit. And so we brought him in for an exhibition and that's where Javier had his opportunity to shine. And, and honestly, he did really good. Javier, you did really good against Bill. And so I think that's where yeah. it all took off, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. where it all took off. But Bill made me look good. He, uh, he carried me until when the stupid announcer said, remember this guy, he goes, who, who do you guys think's winning? Who's winning this? And, and, and Bill goes, raises his hands <laughs> like for him and nobody clapped. And then you ran up to the ring and you asked me if I wanted to come down. I said, no, I'm okay. And right after that, I knew why you asked me if I wanted to come down. He, he launched me. He hit me with a sidekick, <laughs> threw me about four feet back. I come in and I hit him. He hits me again. I come back. The, the, the kicks didn't hurt me so much, but man, he hit me with the left hook. Whoa, that rocked my body. And I was thinking, Holy crap. And then after that, Bill wanted me to go one extra round. And that's when I knew, oh, no, I was too tired. There's no way in hell I was going to go another round because he would have <laughs> beat the hell out of me. You know, yeah. he gave me he, he made me look good. And then he wanted to kick my ass. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I remember you hit him a couple of times pretty good. And that's I did. I did. I said, hey, let's I go did. an extra round, Javier. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. See he what wanted you're to take of. care of me. Yeah, he wanted to take yeah, care yeah. of me. That's really the transition, really, when Javier said, okay, I want to go into fights. And you're talking... Honestly, you're talking about like 1986, 1987 here, maybe. With him. 85. I did. The, 85? The, the, okay. 85. And then you gave me my first fight in 86. Yeah. And I still have those posters, by the way. In oh, fact, really? Jeff, bring me one of those posters here. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. We, we, have, we have some memorabilia for you guys here. This is pretty cool. Now, didn't Superfoot also used to train Elvis, too? Wasn't he? Yes. That's right. He was one of, Ed Parker was, but he was part of that, that Memphis group. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see this. Here, let me see the other one too. That's yeah. pretty cool. This is oh, that doesn't have it. So this is a fight at the High Sierra in 1988, and there's our boy Javier. I don't oh, know wow. if you can see it. It's a little hard if you put it closer. There you go. I think we could see something. Wow, there he is. Can you see it? Oh, we we see Cliff Thomas and Dave Johnson. I think if you move it to the side, we can see Javier Mendez. Oh, the other way, actually. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Good enough. Who else has this? This is memorabilia. This yeah. Is your Listen, I ha I have all of Javier's old posters. I'm just going to hold it for blackmail. That's pretty awesome. So you were teaching Scott before you decided to become a promoter. I know that you were a martial artist, and then you were, came up under Ernie Reyes in the states, but started in Korea, right? Yeah, I started martial arts in Seoul, Korea. It's over there. It was basically you either did in the PE class. They said, "Do you want to do 
soccer? Do you want to do baseball or you want to do Taekwondo? It was part of the curriculum. And that's really when I fell in love with martial arts was taking martial arts when I was living there. When I came here, I started studying with Ernie Reyes in 1974, 75 actually. And I just loved it, man. It was, it's, this has been really, it's been a lifelong journey of being in martial arts. And, and one of the things that I think I'm really grateful for are the opportunities like promoting these fights and getting to meet Javier, getting to meet all the friends and all, all you're really like an outer family or inner family that you, you get to know over the years. And, and these people have been lifelong friends. I've known Javier since, like they said, 1985. I've had wow. other friends that, that we've been friends for such a long time and run the same circles. Really, it's been, it's been, it's really been a blessing, man. So I'm thankful. I'm so ha happy for all of Javier's successes that he's had. And I've watched him grow as a, uh, you know, coach, but a martial artist and the things he's accomplished and, and look, look, look at what he's been doing today. If you look back at the last 20 years, AKA is the, pre the, the premier gym in the planet. What gym has come out with more talent? And I don't mean people coming to the gym and, and joining the gym. I'm talking about homegrown from within. There's no gym in the planet that's done more than AKA for MMA over the last 20 years. Yeah, that's the truth. And it's interesting, like the initial attraction, I guess you guys were both, at the time, we were all Bruce Lee fans. And I was, I remember watching mm -hmm. him, like my yeah. parents, like, you're not allowed to watch, it's too violent, but I'm sneaking him in a movie on an army base over in Italy. And uh, I find out Javier's a big Bruce Lee fan. And I know that was part of what got you guys here. Of course, Bruce. But also, it's, uh, it's funny you're saying about Bruce. We're actually going to meet one of Bruce's only last, one of the very few only last credentialed live students in Vegas and Scott's coming over. We're going to have a meeting with him and I'm going to enjoy that one watching Scotty ask him once. He just, okay. that's just like a great little thing there. And Tony Valenti, a good friend of ours is good friends with the Peter guy that was Bruce, Bruce's uh, old student. And uh, we're going to have a sit down with him. We're going to film it. That'd so be cool. Yeah. Documentary. Good. Yeah. Okay, so listen, I, I, I am probably like the biggest like Bruce Lee fan of all time. I, I have to admit it. It's when you saw somebody on screen like that doing what he does, there's nobody in my mind that has the complete package if you're a martial artist like Bruce did. That's why he's so relevant today because not just the physique, the technique, but also the philosophy and the life lessons that he is still teaching today. And that's what I love about Bruce. And Peter, the gentleman he's talking about, was actually one of the pallbearers uh, in Bruce's funeral that they buried, they buried him in Seattle. I've heard about him for a long time. I really look forward to meeting him and, uh, and really getting to hear firsthand what it was like working out with Bruce and training with Bruce. And these are things that are, are really special to me. It's interesting because you guys are all from the Bay Area. Bruce's schools were in Oakland, San Francisco. And, mm -hmm. and Strike Force was your main promotion. You started with the big one, which I used to love to attend down in San Jose. And then Javier was in San Jose with AKA. This was, uh, it's interesting how it, it's all in one general area in the Bay Area. That always well, makes me think about that. It even goes even further. Scott's the only reason why I'm still a coach. Because I'll tell you what happened while I, while I was training and fighting. I had, Scott and I were going to, to LA. I forgot why we were going to LA, but we were driving to LA. But the, the day before we were going to LA, I had one of, one of my uh, fighters named Gary Gibson. And I was training at Scotty's old gym. He had turned over his old gym to me. He moved two doors down in a bigger space. And he let me use his Taekwondo place to run my kickboxing gym. Well, I had some sparring going on there with this guy, Gary Gibson. And he sparred with my heavyweights, Jim Marlowski, who was the Gold Gloves novice champion. And the guy hit really hard, but he was just, just a husky type of tubby type of guy. But anyways, Jim Marlowski hits Gary Evans with a hell of a shot, knocked him out cold. And I was telling Scotty, I was go, I was so scared. I don't want to coach anymore. I'm done because it scared the hell out of me because the, the guy kept repeating himself over and over and what happened, what this happened, this and that. And I told Scott, I'm done. And he goes, you can't be done. That's who you are. You can't do that. You have to stay through, through your beliefs and your martial arts. And that's who you are. That's what you're meant to be. You can't quit. So I always remember that because that's what kept me in the game. Had he not said that? I might have just quit, to be honest with you, because I, I was horrified by, by my guy getting knocked out and the concussion. And man, it scared me. That, that is so I, I remember that. Yeah. Listen, anytime you have friends that get hurt or get injured, it's an uncomfortable feeling. And I think that's what he was going through was that, that feeling bad process. But there's 
there's always light at the end of that tunnel. It's, this is a life lesson for everybody. And uh, being in martial arts, that's part of the business. Even in the fight game, there's, there's a lot of times where people get knocked out or get hurt. And it's, to me, it's a learning process. But back then I, I remember Javier saying like, this is something uh, I feel bad for him and he's hasn't been the same. And uh, we just had a conversation about, Hey, stay to the course, buddy, you'll get through this. And uh, it was, uh, that, that was the time when we were talking about the, the Gary fight with his other guy, but talking about, you know, Javier, listen, this is a guy that Javier and I used to go to the mall together and hang out. This is how long I've known this <laughs> wow. guy. And I used Never to want to go, I wanted to go play video games at the mall. This is when they had malls, video games at the mall. At yeah. mall. And, uh, and Javier, Javier wanted to just go hang out and look at the girls and, you know, buy yeah. stuff. And I'm like, Hey, I'm going to be here playing video games. Give Give me about an hour and I'll call you back. And then I try to always get him to come play. Hey, huh, come play video games with me at the mall. He's like, oh, no, I, I can't do that, man. That's, I, don't, I, don't do, I don't do video games. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be big into the John Madden football and all that. I mean, he was all into that. I don't know. I, but also the opposite. I took Scott to the nightclub one time and I was into the nightclubs. He wasn't. He was a, He was worse than I was. He was a wallflower. He just stood and just stood there. He just like. This ain't for me. He never drank. Scotty never drank or nothing like that. So nightclub scene was not for him. Nightclub scene was all, I was about, all about the nightclub. And yeah, he was too. not. This was, and this was, Javier actually took me out for my 21st birthday. Wow. And we went to a place called the Baja Saloon. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and I was standing there going, oh, wow, this, this is my first time ever being out like that. And, and we had a couple other friends there. I think Sujin was there and a couple of people we had met there. Yeah. But that's how long I've known Javier, man. This has been a lifelong friend that uh, has been very good. And we've done a lot of great work together. And he's done a lot of great work on his own. And here we are doing his podcast. Now you're famous, brother. Yeah. You're, you're famous. big time. You're somebody now, huh? <laughs> I'm somebody. <laughs> you're in the phone book. No. But I, I think it's really cool because I get to know, I've met you a few times, Scott. You see me so awkwardly that you don't really get to connect. Who's Len? I was filming for some footage for uh, Pops Carvalho, who used to train Javier at a later time. Love Pops. Love Pops. Pops, Pops yeah. is amazing. I and, love him. And, and that's how, it, it's like I started knowing about him, and then he would reveal more about Javier. And I used to have an MMA gym, MMA Jacked in Livermore, and we'd have okay. Jake Shields there. We would have Jake Shields. Okay. We had Rumble there. We had the rap, the rap so pack would come through. So it was pretty cool, but we were filming a lot of your events at Strike Force. I would come film as press, but uh, it was nice. like, I was like, now I hear I am talking to you guys, but I just popped yeah. in Rayman. But let me I, tell I you, a lot. Pop, Pops was somebody that really made an impact on my life, just as, as he did Javier. Here, here's a guy that I'm so happy I went to go see him before he passed in the hospital. You know, about what well, it's been a couple of years Bob, since he passed, I think. Um, three yeah. years, I think. Three about years. years. Yeah, about three years. But, you know, yeah. I, I tell you, man, he was really, he's a guy that from day one treated you like you're a member of his family. Hey, come over. Like you're part of the family yeah. now. And really very much like, uh, like a local Hawaiian style of family treatment. And, and we had a great run together. And he used to always talk about, I have this boxer. His name is Torpedo. And he used to fight here, fight there. <laughs> there was not a better storyteller in the fight game no. than Pops Carvalho. <laughs> he, was, oh. he had the best stories, man. And, no. and I'll, I'll always be thankful to him. And, and, and I think about him quite often, to be honest. So that opened the door how I met Javier. I went in to interview him for something else. And all of a sudden I said, why don't I just work with Javier? I'm one of the most honorable guys I've met in the game so far. And here we are two years later. And we're talking to Scott, which I get to know a lot about you through Hav, kind of like we're doing on this podcast. And I was a big Strikeforce fan. And Hav yep. would have all his fighters on your card. That was great for you two guys. How was that? Just call up Hav who you got and... You had a card because he knew the caliber of fighters. Or it was, was it, more? It, 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 it was one of those deals where he would, Scott would do me a favor, but he wouldn't do me a favor because it, it would look too bad that he was doing me all these favors. So if the guys were worthy, he'd put them in. If they're good ticket sellers, he would put them in. So because he couldn't really come on board and help me because too many people would go, oh, you're just showing them favoritism. So he had that going on. So he did to some degree, but he didn't. He kept a very business professional. There was some things he did for me, but not too much because it, it would be a little too much. As a promoter, you can't do that. And he got heat for it anyways, and he really didn't. But he did get heat out of it. But he helped me, but not like people would think he did. Yeah, Because he did it right. But I will say this, and I'll tell you the truth, because this is I remember the exact day this happened was... We were sitting at flames in front of AKA and on the flames. In fact, I might still have this piece of paper, Hub. 
on the Flames menu, it was like a menu, paper menu in front of you. So I'm sitting there with Hav, and I think there's a couple other people. I think Bob was there, and there's some, I remember there's a couple of people. And so I'm starting to write down, okay, Hav, if I'm going to get into MMA, who, who are the fights that we should make? And who, like, basically saying, who are the guys? He says, you got to sign Josh Thompson. You got to sign this guy. And so we're doing the very, like, the very first event we're in March 10th of 06. We're doing the matchmaking on a Flames napkin, on a paper, <laughs> and I'm writing out all the details. And, and then uh, finally that fight came about because it got postponed a couple of times because of the commission. But finally it happens with Shamrock, Gracie, Kung Lee fought, Josh Thompson fought. And so anyway, it's a great card. We had 18,265 people there, but really it started from that meeting at Denny's and Javier saying, you got to do this guy. Because really, I was a kickboxing guy. I really didn't know a lot about the MMA fighters at the time, Javier. And uh, I said, we have Shamrock, we have Gracie, but what does this thing look like? And so basically, he, he basically laid out the whole fight card. And that's what, how it all began. The genesis of it all, how it all began was prior to like in 2005, sitting down at a restaurant in front of his gym and yeah. having a conversation and laying it out. I'm not sure if you remember that time, but... I remember all that, yeah. Because I, I was always trying to get you an MMA and you go, nah, bro, I don't know anything about it. What would I do? Yeah. Who would I go? I told you, I got all the people. Uh, I know everything. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until you, you wanted to be the first one in California to do a legalized MMA event and you had the arena behind you, the HP Pavilion, they, you had them behind you. So it wasn't until then that you go, okay, let's do it. So then me and Bob would come and sit and talk to you and... Mm-hmm. Because I remember that one thing where I would, I mentioned Gilbert Melendez and, and Bob was, nah, he's too little. I go, but he's the best. He's one of the best. You got to put him on there. And, and now you think about it, right? Look at the great trilogy that him and Josh Thompson had. Him and Gilbert greatest. had the greatest, the greatest trilogy, man. Those, the those were memorable fights, man. Memorable fights. And it all started right there with us talking about get Gilbert Melendez. He was in shooto. Remember, he was in the one shooto, and, but he's a 145er. Bob said he's too small. This, like, no, it doesn't matter. He's he's regarded as number one. That's why you need to get him. And remember, Bob and I would sometimes have a difference of opinion. Oh, and yeah, so you had, sure. You had a chore. You had a chore. Who do you go with? And, 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 and you're smart. You're very smart. You're better than us on who you were going to get. You'd listen to both sides, and you made the decision, but you always made the right decision. I'll tell you, the Gilbert Melendez thing, Honestly, if it wasn't for Javier saying, you got to go sign this kid, he had just beaten a guy by the name of Romina Sato, or he had just fought him. And I think yeah. he beat him. I think he yeah, won. Yeah, he beat him, yeah. yeah. And, right. and so he was, he actually, Javier, he was fighting for the San Luis Obispo Indian Reservation. I'm not sure what the Indian Reservation, but they had fights down there. Yeah, yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah. Tachi Palace, Tachi, Tachi Palace. Tachi Palace. Tachi Palace. Tachi he was Palace, fighting in yeah. Tachi Palace. And so he was fighting there. And, and you go, you should go check him out. So I drove down there. Driving through all the fields to get to the more fields and cow pastures. Then all of a sudden, there's this casino there, and I went to the ver- I went to check him out, and he looked really good. And I, and I did that because Javier said you got to go check this kid out, and and we signed him like a couple of days later because he looked good that night. He had a good performance. But if it wasn't for Javier saying you should go sign Gilbert, we never would have done it. That that's amazing. I spent a lot of time with Gilbert and and Jake coming to the gym because I I basically hired Jake after his kickboxing gym was closing over there, Fairtex in San Francisco. So I said, yeah, come work for me one, once a week, come do a class. It was easy. And he made enough to take care of everything. So then I get to know yeah. you guys, but I'd go down and we, we need, we had this MMA website back then. MMA Jack, we're like, we need footage. We'd go to Hobbs gym. He didn't find any offense with it because it was given play to his fighters. And we did do a lot of videos around strike force back then really love strike force, beautiful production value. And when I used to see Bellator before strike force mm-hmm. was better. I gotta say what you, when you were doing all the things, and I do see the difference between Bellator now and Bellator before. Bellator before seemed more Tahachi Palace, and Bellator now seems like Strike Force Bellator to me. That's what, uh, just from a fan, from someone who's been around, that's what I've seen a lot. Well, I'll tell you, because when I came on board, and no knock to the people that were there before me, their business model was go from Indian Reservation to Indian Reservations, small venues, and they did their tournaments and things like that. And I said, okay, that's fine. Because just like some of the other leagues right now that are out there, even today, they can't sell tickets. It's hard for them to sell tickets. It's hard for them to create a lot of noise because there's so much noise made now between there's the UFC and then there's Bellator. And then to me, there's the rest of the gang, right? So they're out there trying to make noise and it's hard for them to resonate. And, and to me, it's always, look, if you walk into a packed arena, like a big arena, like San Jose Arena, you, then you've made a lot of noise in the community and you made noise in our industry because if you have 18,000 people there, 
just to watch the fight. What does that mean about the awareness and, and the interest that you've created for this event? And so to me, it's always, if you're in a small, you know, little venue and that's your business model, then I think that's how people are going to think of it. It's, it's a small little show, right? That's what it is. Just like some of the other leagues that are out there today. So to me, I said, look, the very first thing is we got to take a look at the roster. And the roster was not that great. And we said we had to improve the roster. And I always felt like how we did it in Strikeforce is we're going to build from the ground up. We're going to go sign the new talent that's out there. And then we're going to buy free agents from the top down. And that's exactly what we did. And But it takes time. It's going to take a, be a three or four year process. And, and I told my staff, I said, look, we have to raise our standards of what's acceptable because what you're doing right now is fine for what you did in the past, but we have to do arena shows and we have to do big, like it has to be big. It can't just be a small little touring company. We have to be in big arenas and we have to do, we have to pack, have to pack these places. I want to grow this brand internationally because we're owned by Viacom. Viacom has a big footprint internationally and it's something that we could do. And I, I got my first meeting with my staff was probably they're looking at me like i was an alien or something because you know <laughs> this guy is crazy we're gonna you know pack the state it takes a lot of work a lot of effort i think we're really good at it i think we're really good promoters and after 35 years you would hope that you have some type of secret sauce or some type of formula that works that makes it that makes people want to come to your fight and but to me always star sell fights let's just be honest when we signed rumble we signed Yo Romero. We signed all the Nemkov beats Bader. Now all of a sudden yeah. this tournament that we have, which I think has the best since Daniel Cormier retired, I might say, I think we have the best 205 pound weight class in the planet now. And, you know, and John Jones Bader. moved up. Yeah, yeah, John Jones moved up. Now listen, anybody that knows MMA knows we have the best 205 pound weight class out there. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So now, but you start adding pieces like this together, makes it very interesting. Now, if we could do this fight in a big arena, I think we would have packed it here in either New York or San Jose or Miami. I think we could have, but with the COVID situation, we have to launch this tournament that doesn't have it. But I think I'm rambling on, but really comes back down to is like, what is your level? What's your level of acceptance of how you want these shows to look? And to me, listen, I work for a company called K1 and I went to a lot of pride shows. Javier went with me to a lot of these shows. When you're in Japan and you're sitting there and you're like, there's 45,000 people in this building. Yeah. This is phenomenal. How is this possible? And, and they do it. They had a dome tour in 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. And the, you're talking about five domes that they did sold out throughout the whole year in, in Japan when K1 was in its heyday and Pride did it yeah. as well. And, but it's, come on, man, that's like unbelievable. And so to me, that was the standard that we all had to get to. That was a standard of excellence. And when I took over Bellator, I said, look, we're going to elevate the standard of acceptance and we're going to go to be number one. And that's the goal. I think you have a great new division at 205. It looks amazing to me. I'm really excited about that Grand Prix. And you're bringing in a lot of talent. And if you look at the metrics and you break it down, it's not just, oh, I have these fancy new names. That means this. No, if you look at their records and you do the analytics, it does add up to the premier 205 that's going on right now. And I think as an outsider, Scott, I think you make fights that you want to watch that I want to watch. I'm, I'm yep. more of the hardcore. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pull in the, the people that haven't been watching and make them new fans too at the same time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you need something dynamic, right? Yeah. And I think that, listen, we have a new platform <laughs> now. We're, we're back on Showtime, which was like the original. It's like, we're going to take another shot at Showtime here. And that's going to be our home. So before we were just, we were in Spike TV and then we went to, we turned to Paramount. We were on Paramount for a while. Then we were at CBS Sports Network. And because the merger happened, their COVID hit, it was it was, there's a lot of bouncing around a little bit, let's say. And, but now we have a home and the home is going to be Showtime. So Showtime is going to do probably 44, 45 boxing and MMA events combined in a year. They're going to be the combat sports channel and they're going to be the best value, uh, proposition value in, in sports combat because you could, you, you could have a sh Showtime subscription and you're going to watch fights every weekend That's now. Awesome. But, but they're going to be the home. And you know what? There's dialogue now with, with big CBS to, to have some fights on there as well. Like we did with Strikeforce. We had the Showtime deal, and then we also had the CBS deal. And so we're in dialogue, and hopefully things will move along. But I feel really good because this is not like a company that is going to have uh, a trouble navigating its TV properties because it's owned by Viacom. Bellator is owned by Viacom. So eventually, I think we'll be able to use all the assets of, of Viacom and get us that exposure that we need because... As far as fights go, I think we're putting on amazing fights, right? Now we have a great home. 
and a great backing because they're going to do things that the other networks didn't do for us. And then, and I think it's because they understand combat sports. Steven has been doing this a very long time. He, look at what he's done for boxing for Floyd Mayweather and that whole boxing program that they've had for a long, since this 1986. Spinoza. Yeah. Since 1986, they've been doing, they've been doing boxing fights since 86. And Steven has been there for 10 years now. And he's the one that got the CBS to invest in the Mayweather deal. When they had me with when he before he retired, they had all those great fights, including the McGregor fight. And so there's a lot of knowledge of how to promote combat sports there. And if you and when we sprinkle different assets of Viacom in, into this into Bellator, I'm telling you, it's going to take it to the a next level. And I'm already seeing some of the benefits of that now, and the enthusiasm and the excitement from our staff and from the fighters and from the network and from the parent company. Uh, it's going to be a great year for for Bellator in 21. I think Javier's got a new tool, not tool, a new amazing boost from, at least from our channel, because he's got Usman, or Usman, or Megamedov, and, uh, and yeah, Habib's cousin. Cousin he's... is going to bring a lot of eyeballs to your thing. Yeah. I think, because we have a lot of, yeah. most of our channels that from that. How's he looking yeah, he's... these days, Hav? He's looking good. He's looking really good. Usman's looking really good, and he's going to impress. April 2nd. Where, where's the fight test, Scotty? Connecticut? Mohegan Sun? Or where? Yeah, he's going to fight at the Mohegan Sun. Actually, all of our fights are probably going to be in Connecticut, the Mohegan Sun. That's our fight bubble, and we call it the fight sphere. And that's yeah. where we're going to have fights until probably July or August. And, okay. and then from there, we'll yeah. see if we can go back to doing regular venues. Yeah, Habib and I will be in his corner. We're, we're always going to be in Usman's corner, Habib and I. So we'll be there. And a lot of people that are Habib fans tune in. So you get to see the eagle fly with the... With the the finisher, I, I call Usman the finisher because finisher. when That's he hurts nice. somebody, when he hurts somebody, he finishes them. Yeah. He's got he's got that that blood, the shark in the water type uh, scenario. This guy, it's not something you can teach. It's just something he has. His dynamics. Mm. I've seen him. I've been there in the gym. He's very uh, very unique. I think it'll bring a it'll bring you a boost on top of your light heavyweights that you got that are already known names. I see good mm -hmm. things for Bellator going forward. A couple of fan questions for you, and I know you had a little time limit. I didn't want to keep you too long. If I could ask you a few of these. Sure. And hopefully these aren't going to unplug like the one I said that I did with Rampage. But <laughs> Let's see. This is from HK1. Who is the young and upcoming Bellator fighter we should watch out for? Who, who's on your, in your, in your name? I'm here just said him. Right. Usman. There you go. I agree. The, the answer. Quick answer. Good job. Yes. Okay. This is from Paco Sir. How do you feel about the careers of fighters that left Bellator to other promotions? Do you think their success or failure reflects on uh, Bellator as a whole? Listen, we, not just us fighters going to other leagues, but also fighters have come to our league. This is just a time where free agency is in place and we will sign certain fighters from other leagues that we by pretty much offering more money than maybe some of the other uh, leagues have offered. And then we're going to lose some. So free agency is in play. And I look at it just like a football team, general manager. So we want to build our light heavyweight division. We're in the process. You know, we're, we're thinking about all that. Sure. We're thinking about, we're going to build this division. And then certain places we need, we need to add more talent and we need to build more talent. So fighters are going to go back and forth because they call them price fighters for a reason, because this is their profession. And, yeah. but for the most part, I, I, I feel like we've done it the right way. And so when fighters leave like a Michael Chandler, I told Michael, my last phone call with him was, hey, listen, I want you to go win that belt and go, go show him how we do it over here because he's one of the toughest kids that I've ever seen fight. And I wanted to wish him luck and there's no hard feelings. We made a business decision and they made a business decision. Everybody made a business decision. He went on. And you know what? To me, this is like Bellator versus USC as far as I'm concerned because he's from our league, homegrown. He's had all his, a lot of great fights here and he's going to go do it over there. And you saw what he could do. And so... To me, there's a lot of fighters over here that will, will do very well no matter where they go. And same thing, because it's not about the letter and the alphabet. It's about the fighter. And that's what I want people to really remember is it's about the athlete. Is It's like saying, if you play for the Dallas Cowboys, does that mean that they're always going to win? No, it's the athletes yeah. that make the great yeah. analogy. The yeah, and, and, yeah. But, the, but don't forget all the talent you had with Strike Force that when you sold Ooh. Strike Force, name them, name them, all the champions. Daniel Cormier, Tyrone Woodley, name all the guys you have. Yeah. Machida, Luke, Machida, Luke you had them all. Yeah. Luke Rockhold, you I mean, had them all, bro. Uh, Luke Rockhold, we, we had, we had, we had Ronda Rousey started in, in Misha Tate. Tate. Cyborg. Yeah, and Cyborg. Listen, we had, the roster that we had was quite amazing. And to me, it's, it's unfortunate because my partners wanted to sell the company. I didn't want to do it, but 
I was either going to be in a bad situation with my partners and have bad feelings, or we were going to sell the company. And so that's what we did. But at the end of the day, again, it proved. What were they saying before they, they acquired these fighters? They were saying, oh, they suck. They're terrible. These guys, disparagement, disparagement, disparagement. And then they come over there and kick everybody's ass. And they're like, oh, these are the greatest fighters ever. It's the same <laughs> fighter. Just because he's fighting over there doesn't mean that he's gotten better like in a six month period. It's because they, they were great fighters already. And hey, let me tell you, I was like the umpire behind home plate with, with my clicker, right? One win, two wins, three wins, four wins. When are we going to lose? Five wins, six wins. We were just crushing them. So to me, it's look, we're going to, same thing with Bellator. If Bellator had a fight off with any other league right now, you know what? It, it would be, depend on the athlete. And it's not about the, the league fighting the league, but with Michael, I wish him luck. He went, he's going to go over there. I hope he wins the title and uh, show him how, how Bellator does it. Hey, that's the thing. Like Javier, at his level, he could look at it without everyone else has seen the flashing lights. We as the fans, but Javier being a pro, he's okay, that guy could beat that guy. But he knows it in his head differently than the average person because he coaches them and he knows the mechanics. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that the outside doesn't know. If I'm, I'm selling you two different soaps, this one's better. It's in a better package. But really... No, I was just the first one on the shelf. That's yeah. right. And, and, and you know what? I'll leave with this thought is fighters, want to, they want, sometimes they want something different, right? So some fighters will want to go to UFC. Some fighters want to fight here at Bellator. And that's just how it's going to be. And sometimes fighters, when they go through a certain, they want to go through free agency, test it, and then they want to see what they're worth. And then it'll be a bidding process. So that's, that's just the reality of the, of the business today. And we're going to be right in there on, there's not going to be a free agent that we're not going to talk to when the time is right. If they're truly free, we're going to be talking to them. And uh, to me, uh, we're going to be in the business of building from the ground up still. We're still buying uh, some free agents from the top down, but we're going to keep this roster going. This is the best roster in the history of Bellator, and we're going to keep it going. I so keep training him, Javier. Javier, keep training him. Get these boys ready for Bellator. <laughs> One last thing that somebody said was, could you please make a fight between Kyle Crutchmer and Dylan Dennis? <laughs> a lot of reasons behind that story. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I tell you, he keeps calling me about fighting Dylan Dennis is our boy, uh, Jake Paul, too. We just you had know? his trainer on the podcast the other day. He yeah. Great. They, they really want to fight Dylan. I, I, would hate, it's, I told him, why can't you come fight in MMA? Come fight him in MMA. Then that's a different story. But uh, they wanted to fight in boxing only. And so that's a tough one because Dylan's really an MMA fighter. He's not just a boxer. So I go, maybe we'll do one for one and we'll talk about it. So they go, we'll call you back. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see where that goes. It might have. You think that ever has a chance of happening, huh? You never know. Anything's possible. I know what to do. They know what they have to do. They have to sweeten something. They got to offer something. They can't just take. They got to give something back. We'll see. Only Scott will know because they got to give him a good proposal. So well, let's see what happens. First of all, he's got to give uh, Ben Askren. That's not, it's, it looks like he can do it. Again, uh, to me, that's like a shark and an alligator type scenario. Any one of those guys can take each other out. I think that the deeper it goes, the better chance Askren has. Because like I said, Jake's only had two fights and experience comes into play. And Ben's a world-class athlete. He's not a boxer by any means, but the guy could take a shot and he knows how to drown you. And that's what I think the, his best chance is to drown Jake. And that's why I don't discount Ben at all whatsoever, because... Th this guy knows how to drown you. He's a good wrestler. He's a world-class wrestler, for God's sake. He, he knows what's up. You know, Scott has a better eye for this than, than most because he got Kimbo. You had the first YouTube star. You had him, you know? Actually, the, really, he was signed with, I think it was Elite XC first. Elite, Elite XC. XC. Back, I was back there for that. Day. Yeah. Were you collaborating yeah. with them in that? Were you co-promoting uh, with them? Yeah, we're... Shared uh, cross-promoted fighters, uh, right? Yeah. right? Yeah, basically, no, we had a co-promotion agreement. Because we did Shamrock versus Kung Lee together. We did Gina versus, no, not Gina versus Cyborg. But we did a couple fights together. Oh, we did Phil Brony. Phil versus Frank. Phil Baroni versus Phil Frank. Baroni. Yeah, and so we did that fight together. So we did a couple fights, and he was fighting for them at the time. But, man, what, talk about a guy that crossed over. Man, this guy had a fan base that was unbelievable. And when he showed up, even just in the arena, you could feel his presence. Like, this guy is a star. And... Everywhere he went, he was like the Pied Piper, man. People would just follow him. And it's one, one time we're sitting in the casino in, in uh, St. Louis and we're doing a fight in St. Louis and he was, and he gets there and he gets there. And when people found out he was there, huh, people were tripping out, man. They, so this line starts, line starts and the line was out the door trying, just waiting for him to finish eating so they could ask him for an autograph or take a picture. And it, it was just unbelievable, man. The guy had that, he just had it. 
either now some fighters have it like some or fighters are great fighters yeah some fighters are great fighters but that doesn't mean that they have that x factor that personality they don't. that people no, just I, gravitate I, 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 you know what i mean yeah it's no, like, I, yeah I, I know a few but i, I won't say their names but yeah they, I won't have, say they don't have either. the x factor but but some people just have it like they just people gravitate towards them they might not be the best fighter but you know what they're definitely the most popular that's so true. I think that's going to be that's going to be a great move. Hopefully, that deal comes together at some point for you. How do you see that fight going down between those guys, between Askren and Jake Paul? What do you think? Last time I gave my opinion, last time I gave my opinion, Ben Askren was mad at me, started attacking me on. on I'm, gonna be the, I'm going to be the bigger man here. I, say, like, I have no comment. I'm always for the mixed martial artist against the boxer, but uh, I wish you luck. Good luck. Let's go do this for MMA. <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one yeah it's redeeming thank you for it's coming on the team. podcast today yeah, it has been a great tre- pleasure and treat to see the foundation of where it all began and it's fun to have you two, two buddies that grew up together in the business it's so nice to see you guys on the same show yeah i'd like to just say this javier is like a brother to me and is a family member and we need him to keep training those fighters over there huh? we need to get some more talent bellator's got some <laughs> contracts ready for your boys no, but seriously anytime Guys, listen, this has been fun. I have a lot more stories. I didn't want to bust them out the first time because I don't want to have you to get embarrassed. But next time I'll bust them all out. No, there's a lot. We, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> we'd love to have you back. And also closer to your fights and stuff, if we can add a few here and yeah. there. And there's more. Let fan me know. Questions, but you get a timeline. And I mean, Javier's give me 50 fan questions. I'm not going to torture you like that, Scott. Fans yeah, want yeah, to yeah. be heard, but we can save them for the next. No, I'm, I'm happy to do it.